Hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Spencer Rukti. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. Uh, on behalf of the bookstore, I'm so pleased to welcome you to this evening's conversation between Andrew Lipstein and Hermione Hobie. Uh, they are with us tonight to talk about Last Resort, which is Andrew Sharp debut novel. It is funny and propulsive, and I can't wait for to hear more about it. So first of all, I wanna invite you all to uh, use the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Let us know um, where you're calling in from and say hello. And secondly, through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Third Place Books is very fortunate to continue filling its mission of connecting readers with authors in community spaces. But uh, we do sorely miss having authors in our stores, but at the same time, we're thankful to have the uh, miracle of virtual events um, that bring our event series into your homes all across the world. So thank you so much for tuning in and for supporting independent bookstores. Uh, we are very proud to host a number of exciting virtual events, uh, virtual and in-person events this season, which you can find on our website, thirdplacebooks.com. On January 3rd, uh, we're hosting David Gooderson here at our Lake Forest Park store at 7 p.m. Registration is required in advance and we'll be checking vaccination at the door. And from the comfort of your own home, uh, you can watch our virtual event on Saturday, February 19th with the Nobel Prize winning Polish author Olga Tokarczuk at, uh, and her translator Jennifer for Croft. That event is in collaboration with our good friends at Community Bookstore in Brooklyn and the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith in Boston. So for our West Coasters, that virtual event will take place at 10 a.m., but if that's too early for you, you can always register for free and receive a recording of the event. I also encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter um, for the latest on our author event series. I'll be posting a link to that in the chat later this evening. As I mentioned before, the chat window at the bottom of your screen is open and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Tonight, we will also have some time for your questions. So if you have questions for our authors this evening, please submit those in the Q&A window below, uh, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. We also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. Just click the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn this feature on or off. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Andrew Lipstein is calling us tonight, uh, or is with us tonight and calling in from Brooklyn. His novel, Last Resort, is what people in bookselling parlance call quite simply a pretty damn good book. It is tightly wound, the sentences are extremely good, and Andrew is able to throw characters at one another's throats with perfect timing, both uh, you know, part suspense, part comedy. So if you hang on to stories in the news about literary success and its moral quandaries, this one is definitely for you. And Andrew's second novel, Flash and Yearn, will be published in 2023 by Frauer, Strauss, and Giroux. So joining Andrew in conversation today is Hermione Hobie, the author of the novels Neon and Daylight, a two-time New York Times editor's choice, and Virtue, which was published in July and called Intensive and Addictive by the New York Times. Hermione writes about literature, visual art, film, and music in Harper's, the New Yorker, The Guardian, Vanity Fair, and elsewhere. And she is calling us today from Boulder, Colorado. Ron Charles at the Washington Post uh, recently wrote of Last Resort that it, quote, if you ever wondered where writers get their ideas from, Last Resort is wicked fun. If you're a writer, Last Resort is heartburn in print. He goes on to say that splayed across these pages is the dark terror that lurks within any creative person's breast, the embarrassing facts that might demolish the glorious claims made in the name of literary invention. If that doesn't inspire you, then I invite you to listen in on tonight's conversation. And afterwards, you can pick up Last Resort uh, for yourself from your local bookstore. Um, that could be Third Place Books if you're in the Seattle area, or if you're in Andrew's neck of the woods, may I recommend a Greenlight Bookstore in Brooklyn which I'll tell you receives a prominent cameo in the novel as the locale of a book launch that is every event manager's nightmare, but uh, no spoilers. So without further ado, please put your hands together for Andrew Lipstein and Hermione Hobie. Uh, welcome to the screen. Thanks so much, Spencer. Thanks, Spencer. <laughs> um, Andrew, will you read for us? I hope we might begin that way. I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm gonna read the first few pages from the book. Caleb, it's brilliant, he said, not listening. Brilliant. He was looking past my ear to the bar where I assumed our server must be or some other woman. That our waitress wasn't conventionally attractive didn't stop him from making a face at me after she'd introduced herself and walked away. 
I had mirrored it, raising my eyebrows and sucking in my lips before taking a sip of water to break the moment. His eyes came back to me. He clasped his hands, placed them on the table, and began talking. I could hardly listen. I couldn't stop thinking of the affectations infecting his words. Do get in touch. Have a go, if I could be so daring. Unearned pauses, overemphasized mm-hmms, and how rampant it is in the book world and elsewhere, like the cafe by my apartment stocked with people who dress like artists on weekends but spend their weekdays on Slack. He ended his brief soliloquy with something about Mavis Gallant, whom I never read and whose name I thought was pronounced differently. I looked it up when I got home. He was right. This was all in response to a new story idea, which was a response to him asking me if I had my next book in mind. Next book, as if the one we were meeting to discuss were already in the past, which was supposed to be a seg from our aimless banter to real business talk. When I told him the new story idea, a party of 30 somethings where everyone slowly realizes death is present, literally in the room, in disguise, and by the end of the night, it will take one of them, so that the entire time they all have to prove how full of life they are, he said, a word or two before I finished, love it, which made me hate it and regret ever having dreamt it up. Ah, gallant, I said. He looked at his hand, rubbed his pointer and middle fingers together, then scanned the room. He said he wished we could smoke in restaurants and then, thanks, Giuliani, which I thought was an ironic riff on, thanks, Obama, which is already ironic. Also, the smoking ban was Bloomberg, not Giuliani, but he was apparently sincere. This tarnished some of my assumptions about him mainly that he should be unflaggingly smooth. Ellis Buford was a quote-unquote big shot agent, a phrase I'd heard from too many people with too little irony. He was taller than I'd expected, but less handsome in some inscrutable way. I disliked him the second we shook hands, when he apologized for being late. Please forgive my truancy, he'd said. But all of that didn't matter. Nothing mattered in the face of the fact that he was a big shot agent who was going to change my life. Yes, the phrase is ridiculous, but the concept transcends ridiculousness, the concept being power. Big shot. Those two words were the first my lips formed the second we hung up after he called me out of the blue on the Saturday morning, four days before our lunch. I was lying on my couch, drinking coffee, listening to John Wizards at full blast, my roommate was out of town, and playing chess online with my computer on my stomach, a ritual I don't normally interrupt before it fulfills its purpose, a bowel movement. When my eyes wandered to the window, catching sight of a building in the distance. I recognized it and was, and was taken aback. The building was in Brooklyn Heights, meaning that my window didn't look south but west. That I'd been mistaken about the cardinal orientation of my apartment for the three months I'd lived there was unbelievable. I was someone who could point north any time of day. I considered finishing the game, but I was going to lose anyway. So I put on my slippers and walked downstairs and around the apartment until I found my fire escape. I turned around and found the building again. I was right, I realized. I'd been wrong that whole time. And that's when my phone rang. Caleb, he said. Yes, I said. This is Ellis Buford. I've just finished your novel. Do you have time? The waitress had seen him look around the room and, misinterpreting, came over with a pen and pad in hand. Nothing more than accessories, surely. An ironic kitsch addition to an atmosphere that seemed designed for readers of Maxim. Reclaimed wood clashed with metallic chandeliers classed with the mid-century modern furniture and attire. It didn't make any sense, but nothing made any sense anymore. And also sometimes a nice Soho dress is all you need to charge $36 for a lunch lamb shank, which is what he ordered us both, along with a Heineken for him. When the waitress looked at me, I forgot I could speak. To save me from embarrassment, Ellis said the place had great Manhattans. And I said, that's great, I'll have that. As soon as she walked away, he jumped right in, as if we'd been discussing the book the whole time. He told me how he'd position it, and me, the story behind the story, which as far as I could tell mostly meant my age, 27, which I didn't think was that young, but he seemed to think it was. And didn't you finish it when you were 24? I hadn't, and demurred. That's prodigy eligible, he said. He then spouted a laundry list of words and phrases describing the book in my style, my aesthetic, that he would try out with editors, some of which would end up on the back of the book and eventually in the mouths of critics and booksellers and, if all went well, Terry Gross. And who knows, Seth Meyers? During all this, he elegantly wove in his own past successes and what they did or didn't have in common with how my manuscripts might be sold. Something in me disliked this kind of talk, made me feel I should cling to the purity of art when confronted with the vulgarities of commerce. But another instinct, a better instinct, made me exhale, sit forward in my chair, put my elbows on the table, 
and listened intently as this man considered my book in much the same way he considered our waitress as she laid down our drinks. Thank you so much. There's, I'm sure there's applause happening now that you just can't hear, thanks to the, the weirdness of being on the internet. Um, Andrew, it's such a pleasure to get to talk to you about this book. And I should just say, before I jump in with actual questions, I today I was like, well, I'll just give it a quick skim, a reread to prepare. And then I kind of looked up and I just, you know, been reading for three hours and that was on a second read. So uh, I, you. you know, it's it's a truly immersive, um, uh, incredibly propulsive, I think that was the word Spencer used, novel, and I, I hope you're feeling proud. Um, so the, the wonderful opening you just read includes this phrase, um, the purity of art versus the vulgarity of commerce. And one of the thing that, things that so impresses me about the book is that uh, this is not, such a dyad is not, kind of explicitly wrought in the characters and Caleb in particular is very intriguing because he does really have talent and quite early on he says these um, sincere quite affecting things about writing he says uh, let me be honest in a way I couldn't otherwise be it brought me closer to myself um, but then <laughs> mixed up in this is also some rather more vulgar uh, impulses, I guess. So I, I'm curious how you tempered those two as you were building this character, whether you conceived of him from the start as, uh, as having those things in balance or whether your conception of him changed as you were writing him. How did all that play out? Yeah, um, I mean, to write that character and to, I guess, have him exist between those two things that are often at odds, but sometimes don't have to be and collude for some, you know, true madness and disaster. You know, I really accentuated some of my most kind of base emotions and instincts as they have to do with writing. Um, I think like a, a book is just so much different than writing. When a book enters the world and, um, you know, you have a publisher, you have marketing, you have reviews, you have things that affect whether people will read it or not. Now, having gone through that process, process myself, it just feels like entirely distinct from, from creativity, from writing, from feeling inspired. And the point in the book where Caleb writes La Last Resort, the name of the book within the book, you know, it's kind of a, sort of boarded off from the rest of his life. It happens very fast. Mm -hmm. It feels natural. He describes it like he's watching a TV show. Um, and then basically the rest of the book is what happens to that story once it's out of his hands. And that isn't to say that I planned any of that or, you know, use that to point out the differences between writing and books. But I do think that represents a lot of how I felt like in my own writing and trying and failing to get published in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, to my mind, it seems like these two activities required of authors are just <laughs> completely different. One, one is external and, and the other requires, yeah, the, the internal. Um, so I hope you've been feeling not too psychotic recently because I, I know my experience of putting a book out is just like being feeling like a phony representative of myself. So I didn't mean to dive into therapy quite so early. No, I, I, think, I think you hit the nail on the head when you, with the word phony. I think it's, you know, it requires something of you, even when you're getting an agent and an editor and working with your publishing house to basically be in business with people, yeah. um, which is not natural basically for anybody, but I think especially not uh, writers. Yeah, yeah. And it all this plays out so wickedly and deliciously uh, in the novel. Um, I... Uh, I saw one um, review describe it as um, anti kunstler roman, and I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, so I guess I have a sort of two part question, which is um, uh, whether you feel, um, well, whether you feel that's true. I mean, to my mind, Caleb sort of begins as an artist and then perhaps becomes less of an artist, not to give away mm. too much, but also whether you feel, um, I don't know, in any way opposed on principle 
to the Kunstlerroman. Like perhaps it's just not an appropriate vehicle for 2021 and our literary culture. Yeah, it's funny. Someone posted on Twitter, and I won't, I won't attempt to say the word, which I assume that you said correctly. Um, oh, this, probably not. No. Well, better than me, that this was the third review in the past like two weeks that had used that word. So I think it's on the mind of a lot of people. But what I think that has in common with buildings, Roman, also slaughtered that word. Um, it nailed it. And why these times sort of call for something else is that they all imply uh, a change of character. They all imply that at the start of the book, someone is missing something. And through the events of the book, they grow in a positive way. Yeah. And, you know, that's sort of never been true, but especially now when, you know, we need stories that sort of show a downfall instead of somebody becoming better for the adversity that's thrown at them. I just thought it was, it felt more um, realistic. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in what you just said, because I, I feel like particularly with the, the sort of cult of the personal essay, I feel like that often proceeds on this fallacy that is, suffering is ennobling and suffering is inherently interesting and indeed literary and I feel like so many of my favorite books are um you know I don't know I think I mean this is the example that always comes to mind of Nicholson Baker's The Mezzanine in which nothing happens and it's totally boring and it's fascinating and I would so much rather read that than a less skilled writer you know depicting in some kind of thinly veiled way a terrible thing that that happened to them um, it, do you feel like that's that's something that was playing in your mind with with this? I mean, you said like we we need we need stories that don't uh, show someone becoming better. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think if the mezzanine was published today, given the landscape of things, like it probably would be published by I think a really small press and probably yeah. you know would get attention if 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 a notable critic brought it to light, but it would probably quickly be shuffled under the category of experimental fiction or something like that. Um, I just think um, to publish a novel where you're trying to show a story, if some books don't show a story, um, involves an arc of some sort. So I still wanted that when I wrote Last Resort. It just wasn't the arc of basically low to high to sort of low to finally high, which, which is, you know, the hero's plot. Yeah. I mean, we can't talk about the end because I don't want to spoil it for people, but I just want to say the end is audacious and thrilling and well, people should read it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I wish we could talk about it. The, yeah, I will say that the end was funny because I um, that wasn't the original ending at all when I was ready to sell the book and be done with it. Mm. And um, at the time I was working with an agent who got the attention of an editor who wanted it um, rewritten basically and I did kind of entirely worried that he wouldn't accept the book and I would, I would have spent all that energy on nothing which turned out to be exactly true um but not but another you know I found an editor obviously and I'm just so thrilled that I did because the previous ending I think in retrospect entirely sucked mm, great well I'm very glad we have the ending we have and I don't even want to know what the alternative was because you know I want to preserve a perhaps um, outmoded uh, view of a book as, I don't know, as something, uh, I guess I'm talking about mystique and we were, <laughs> you know, we were talking a bit about um, uh, the Kunstler Roman, which again, I'm probably not saying correctly. Um, but I, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot recently about how the concept of selling out no longer really seems to pertain or at least way less and there's a kind of um uh, an increasing shamelessness uh, about people talking about personal branding or whatever and literary you know the literary industry or world is not immune to that by any means um i just wonder how despairing and or hopeful you feel about American literary culture right now, which this novel is so engaged with. Yeah, I, you know, it's good that you really only pay attention to the bright spots, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I guess, is a coded way of saying like, you know, sometimes it can be frustrating to see what people focus on. Um, 
But I will say that I think that morality and our obsession with having stories that from the get-go are morally correct, you know, like how many times do we see a new release that's billed as challenging and it's like exactly the opposite of that. It's sort of, yeah. you know, you, you're, you're not going to even be able to read it unless you already agree with the author or, you know, the narrative that the book is, is stating. Um, yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. I see a lot of that and I mm. find it really depressing. It's almost like there's a kind of, um, I think then the reader feels a sort of self-congratulation. They're like, you know, I'm reading a correct book that says something that should be like, I don't know, like, morally axiomatic you know like yeah I, bad. <laughs> I think that a lot too and then I also think like you know books as a default are sort of so boring that that can't be the only motivating factor that people are coming to books to have their own um morality you know reinforced um I do also wonder how much Trump has to do with things where basically you know writing about Trump or you know, writing that it all hints or whiffs of the current political moment, there's definitely a wrong answer. And, you know, having a wrong answer in art is just, it would just, it just kills art, you know, for there to be any sort of assumptions of morality to, to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And we live in woefully moralizing times, I think. Um, I, we were talking before we went live or whatever, talking in our virtual green room about um, Christian, the critic Christian Lawrence, and I, you know, in, in rereading today, I thought of this um, piece he wrote about Philip Roth, who of course um, is no longer with us, and, um, but he was talking about uh, our, our moment now uh, and he said the dominant literary style in America is careerism which is quite a chilling thought but <laughs> how does that strike you do you see that yeah I remember reading that in the I think that was like what where was that published in book form, book form. yeah that was like the the copy that they used to get you to click on the link or something and I thought it was really interesting and I was intrigued um but I think if you can accuse Roth of careerism, you know, I just don't think he, compared to today's authors, could even be at risk of careerism because he didn't have the expectations of, you know, um, digital exposure of basically, you know, fending for yourself, you know, networking, that disgusting term, um, which I guess on a positive perspective could be seen as equalizing in some way. Mm. We don't have that. There are fewer gatekeepers. And mm -hmm. obviously decades ago, the gatekeepers were promoting certain people. Mm -hmm. um, that's the positive way of looking at it. But of course, I, I would agree 100% that careerism is what makes um, the majority of literary careers. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Do you think it's getting worse? Um, I feel like we are at a breaking point where you have a lot of skepticism towards, you know, to be frank, this sort of liberal, centrist liberal modes of thought. I think it helps that, honestly, Trump is out of office. Um, people are sort of questioning what exactly they're for now that we don't have something specific to be against. And I think that's showing a lot of dividing lines between regular people. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm curious whether you had models in mind as you were writing this, whether in terms of style or. There was, um, I, there's just one person really. I, right before I started writing, I basically blazed through the Edward St. Aubin and Patrick Melrose novels mm -hmm. and then watched the Showtime adaptation because I just couldn't get enough. And he, he's just, I mean, obviously a great writer obviously very dark, gives you a window into like the elite. People are sort of passive aggressive when they're not just being aggressive aggressive. And it's a lot of, you know, a lot of inter, you know, there's a lot of emotional dynamics that are, you can't look away, but he's also so funny in a way that's not like, that no critics would describe him as funny. Just like the word challenging. Like, I feel like whenever a book is described as humorous or funny, you just know that like, you're not gonna laugh out loud once. And with him, it's just like, 
he's he's just so effortlessly funny and like f fierce and um I read that right before I started and I just felt like it was freeing in a way mm, in what way freeing I thought it was freeing you know the first the first paragraph of my book is you know two men one of them is commenting um non-verbally on the looks of a woman and the men are sort of um, non-verbally bonding over this fact. And, you know, it's so, um, it's something that happens and it's something that's wrong. But when yeah. I wrote that, I felt it was freeing in the way that um, that wasn't like the end of the story. It wasn't that these, both these people are um, purely bad and will always root against them. Absolutely. And, and I thought that his characters too, he gives people, he makes people really morally corrupted, but never once is that a permanent label on the character. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you felt free. And I think that that shows in these characters who are changing all the time and our sympathies are, are shifting all the time between them. Um, I particularly loved so, I mean, to, to set it up, but without giving too much away, uh, there were two main characters. There is our narrator, Caleb, and then there is a kind of frenemy relationship. Well, perhaps more enmity than friendship um, with Avi. And the scenes between those two, the kind of the affability and the hostility, I just, I haven't read such a good depiction of kind of young American men talking and and that mode of masculinity and i i don't even quite know what my question my question is sort of an envious writer's one which is like how do you do that how did you do that um but i wonder whether you i don't know did sneaky things like you know replay and trans mentally transcribe conversations or um just how you managed to tune into that i mean i'm thinking of a, a lovely line early in the book uh where caleb is sort of failing and he says something like you know i am unable to transcribe the song in my head and so many of those moments felt like a perfect transcription of some kind of song so hmm. how did you do it <laughs> yeah i i think it's a, it's a very specific type of relationship between um sort of rivals uh wh where you wouldn't ever kind of bring that word to your own head but um mm -hmm. between two men who are sort of young and insecure in a very specific way yeah um, and the chap in the excerpt i read caleb says you know you said 27 is young which i didn't think was that young and of course when you're 27 you actually think that 27 is not that young you, you, know, you okay. think i've already seen things you know obviously you're very very young um and i think there's a certain um rivalry over successes, especially if you have any sort of um, similar aspirations or ambitions, um, where the other's success really pains you in a way that almost feels personal. And I haven't experienced that so much. Actually, just before this talk, I was speaking with a friend who sort of the character of Lewis is based on mm -hmm. just about how the publishing of my book has felt. And I mean, we're just brutally honest with each other. Whereas Avi and Caleb, you know, everything they say is sort of disguised and they're almost really saying it to themselves instead of the other person. Mm -hmm. And you have all these layers of obfuscation that I was, I guess to answer your question, it wasn't really based on something in particular. Yeah, you were just paying attention, clearly. Maybe. <laughs> um, you will probably predict I was gonna bring this up. In October of last year, in the New York Times magazine, there was a story titled, Who is the Bad Art Friend? I'm sure many people in attending uh, read this story or heard about this story. It's about two squabbling writers and it's a kind of dispute over stolen material. I remember seeing a friend of mine who teaches journalism say something like, uh, she tweeted something like, um, you know, if a student had pitched this story, she would have discouraged it because the stakes seem so low. It's like, you know, these are kind of writers not many people have heard of, even if anyone, and, um, you know, no money, like $200 is involved or whatever. Um, 
so I'm curious why you think the story went viral and also whether you were delighted by it because it speaks so resonantly to your book. I, I mean, I listened to it um, narrated and I just didn't want it to end the entire time. I like right. paused it just so I could extend it. And I think, I think the number one reason why it became viral is the same reason that why true crime documentaries succeed in that you never know what exactly is going on. You never yeah. know who exactly to root for. I mean, the, the original events that took place in that story is a woman donated her kidney, um, which at the start of any story would establish her as you know the morally righteous person and of course her fault was that she was the other definition of righteous she was overly proud also a shitty writer um and it was really her story to tell but she couldn't tell it which of course is a great parallel with last resort mm -hmm. um but yeah i thought that story deserved to go viral for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it seems also that it's perhaps tapping into an anxiety about art itself and mm -hmm. I think people are feeling uneasy about the made up and uh was that were those kinds of things playing in your mind I mean I know a few years ago you know the kind of phrase du jour was fake news and that seemed to speak to you know an anxiety about authorship in general mm -hmm. were these things playing on your mind or did they emerge um, from the book itself. Yeah, I thought about autofiction, probably not as I was writing, but maybe as I was editing, and why, first of all, it's popular, and also whether it's actually a thing. I mean, many people have pointed out that it's not some sort of new trend um, for a writer to be lifting things straight from their life. It's just something that was made notable by select people like Ben Lerner or Sheila Heedy, etc., um, but I also thought about why from the other side as a writer, it feels so, why it attracts writers. And I think the reason is the same reason why I put a lot of myself and my own life events in this book is that there's a sense of higher stakes. Yeah. Um, and I think autofiction, the period of writing that autofiction replaced was basically these stories that sort of tried to be realistic, but in the end were, you know, like thoroughly written plots that felt totally removed from life. And because of that, when they failed, or when books weren't interesting, the book just felt so ignorable and so low stakes and like totally separated from, from reality. Um, so I thought about out of fiction in that regard that about stakes and how it could help a book feel more real just to the writer, I think. Yeah, is that why it is first person? Yeah, I, I um. I love writing in first person because you can be flawed. I think I say something similar in the book, but without knowing it, you know, I, I think of first person as a form of acting where you think you're the character and maybe you have the flaws that they do. And then you stumble upon things that you can communicate to the reader without having to like, you know, invent them or create little metaphors that are messages and things like that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you have all those little details that come out, but you could also really put your own emotion into it. I mean, I love writing from a point of anger or passion or like thinking about my desires in a way to be more comfortable with them by gifting them to a character or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, which is obviously sort of a deranged form of therapy, but. It's a great form, yeah. And there are just wonderful moments of anger um, uh, throughout the novel. Um, I guess I'm I'm returning slightly to a to a previous theme, um, but there's a I mean so many mordant lines, but I just want to read this one. I was beginning to understand that for a book like this, that is a debut with a reportedly outsized paycheck, not having read the thing didn't preclude you from having an opinion. There was already a narrative taking shape. I just can't imagine what sort of forgive my language but mind fuck it must be for you to have written a novel about the narrative around a novel and then to be putting out a novel and wondering what the narrative around your novel might be and have you been paying attention to reviews uh did you anticipate a narrative 
Um, how's all that playing out? Yeah, I mean, well, I wish I wish my paycheck was either outside, right. really, or realistically outsized. Um, you know, every every writer wants there to be a narrative that takes shape around the novel, and you know, the old saw about publicity is is correct. Even books that sort of everyone is ready to hate, that's great for the writer and the and the publicist. Um, you know, you just want as many people to talk about the book as possible. Um, like when you mentioned Bad Art Friends, when that happened, I was sort of conflicted because I thought maybe it would make the novel more relevant in some way. You know, there's at least three years between when you start writing a book to when it hits, you know, shelves. Books that you see today were written in the thick of the Trump presidency or even before. Um, so anything that can make it more relevant helps. But at the same time, you know, that happened after I'd written the book and really has nothing to do with the book. So to answer your question, you know, I wish there was uh, some juicy narrative, something that would just make at least everyone hate hate Last Resort, the book I wrote, not the book within the book. Um, but yeah, and you have another novel coming out this year, is that right? Next, next year. year. Next mm -hmm. year. Congratulations! What can you yeah. tell us about that? Uh, just a whole other zone of. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I could describe it because I'll probably regret how I describe it. But uh -huh. um, I'll say that the the moral quandary in Last Resort takes place inside of the main character, um, and he's sort of torn from within. Whereas in my next book, it's something that happens to um, the protagonist that sort of. Is, is morally incomprehensible and he doesn't know what to do with. Mm, how exciting. <laughs> Lucky us. Um, uh, let's see. Um, sorry, now I'm, I'm losing track of where we are. Um, there is um, another beautiful line, um, and I hope this doesn't take too much explanation, but the Caleb's girlfriend's father ha is now aging and kind of sick. And um, there's a moment where they go back and visit the building that he built. And there is this line, it wasn't so important that the world knew who built it, just that he could claim it as his own. And I suppose, I mean, this is sort of a cheeky question, but I, I wonder, you know, whether you, <laughs> whether you were to find yourself in Caleb's position, which is, and can we give this away? I hope this isn't giving too much away. Sure, it's fine. Okay, so, so Caleb. Oh, yeah, why not? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess it happens Let's early go. enough for it to be. Yeah. Okay, okay so uh, Caleb uh, is. Well, this is, a, this is a spoiler warning. So if you don't want to hear it, you know, mute yourself. Yeah. Or you know, turn off your vo your volume for the next <laughs> and then we one to four minutes. Signal. Well, Andrew, maybe I should pass it over to you, and you should just tell us what this situation is with Caleb and the choice he must make. Okay, so spoiler: um, <laughs> Caleb has to des decide whether he gets the money from the book or his name on the book, and he chooses to have his to get the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. But I guess, I guess I'm curious how this relates to this beautiful moment um, with Emmett and the, the building. And we see Emmett's satisfaction and that's because he knows he built it. Um, but for Caleb, it's a bit more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's pained by people not knowing. So um, I suppose, did you think yourself into this choice? <laughs> and how much does that align with Caleb? You know, I, that, um, that sort of came from a different part of my life, actually. Um, and it didn't, I didn't really even consider that to be the genesis until, you know, I, I was done editing the book. Um, but basically a close family member of mine had an injury that um, prevented him from working anymore. And, you know, so much about legacy and pride in your work and things like that. Um, seeing that just affected me a lot and made me think about, you know, when, when we're done working, what will we have had? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there will come a day when we stop working 
all of us. And no matter what it is, how prideful we are in it, whether it's a job or whether it's our passion, um, there comes a day when you're done and you can only look in the past instead of, instead of doing something that you've spent your whole life doing. And, you know, for Emmett, he can't work anymore, but he at least can claim his work as his own. And of course, Caleb, Caleb can't do that. Um, so that actually, it wasn't really about me or anything I was feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking of this question and I, I don't mean to bum us out too much, but I've been thinking of this question as it relates to art, as it relates to um, <laughs> our planetary doom and climate change, because I think there was this sense that, you know, if one published a novel or published a book, I don't know, a hundred years ago, it would be not entirely crazy to think um, it could be, you know, read hundreds of years from now. And now I'm like, will the planet just be on fire in, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Like what, you know, I, I, the, there's that kind of, the, the future of future readers. Um, I mean, of course it's never a, a certainty, but the possibility of, of future readers seems imperiled. Um, I, I hope this hasn't been weighing on you, but I'm curious whether it has, because it's it's um well, something that troubles me. <laughs> I think I think conceptually that's really it has been um on my mind, not necessarily climate change, but something that actually happens at the end of your book, Virtue. And I won't I won't serve it back with a spoiler, but um sorry, I feel bad I pushed this into spoiler territory. No, like every 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 review basically gave that away also. It's 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 fun. Um, <laughs> is, is that, is that you often when you're obsessed with something, it's the only thing you want, there will come a day where something undercuts that completely and puts it in perspective. Yeah. Um, that yeah. happens in last resort. It happens in virtue. And of course, you know, climate change, if the world ends in 50 years or a thousand or 50,000, there'll still come a day where all books are done. And basically, uh, the illusion that art somehow preserves us is shown as an illusion. And um, it's kind of one of those things that you know, but you can't actually internalize, which I think is the problem with climate change to begin with, because we all sort of uh, know what's projected, but, you know, we walk around that it rains, sometimes it doesn't, it gets hot, it gets cold. So um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope people will continue to read, even if the planet is burning. That's my pathetically naive and, and wishful hope. <laughs> well, ebooks, you know, if all the books burn, there's still, still digital copies of everything. Yeah, I just, yeah, I think if the apocalypse comes, you know, it will be softened by great literature. That's, that's the hope. <laughs> I think that's a writer's dream, but. Maybe. Yeah, everyone will be reading Moby Dick while the while the world is burning, just like slow, slow paced stuff only. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I've merged back on screen to usher in questions from the audience here. Um, we have a few questions here for uh, both you, uh, Andrew, and you, Hermione here. Um, the first question, let's see, let's start with this. Um, so first of all, for Andrew, uh, we have a question from Chris who asks, how did your thick skin interviews affect your writing of this novel? Um, and for those of us who don't know, uh, if you could also tell us a little bit more about your thick skin interviews, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so I've done an interview series where I interview authors about their negative reviews, either from, but both from professional reviewers and readers on Goodreads and um, Amazon. And, you know, it did affect the book a lot. The book obviously is about the publishing industry written by someone who has never had a book published. And um, hearing how writers think about their books, how they, I mean, the series is about ego, you know, and, and Last Resort is in large part about ego. Um, a lot of, there's not a lot of the book about reviews. There's of course some reviews in there, but um, that series, I think, gave me perspective on sort of how writers save themselves from the inevitable damage to their ego that goes with the right. publishing process. And that's not just reviews, that's basically, you know, every part of it. Wonderful. Um, let's see, Emily asked, 
Uh, as a writer, were you hoping that we would like Caleb or not, or do you think that's irrelevant? Yeah, I think that's irrelevant. I think, you know, some of my own Goodreads reviews have mentioned, someone even had basically like a spoiler warning, spoiler warning or a trigger warning that this book features unlikable characters. You know, I think all of these characters are hopefully, ideally, at times likable and at times unlikable, just like real people are. Yeah, and I think, yeah, books like that are much stronger for, I think of like uh, Andrew Martin's early work where you have some some characters you're really, I mean, they're all enjoyable in that they're like witty and intelligent and they just, I mean, they just have intelligence about them, but um, they're always, they're always making bad decisions. Uh, let's see. So we have also a question from, uh, let me pull up this chat here. Oh, so Roger Strang asks, uh, he says, if I'm right, and if not, not please correct me, uh, you felt like we needed different kinds of stories than the hero's arc. Uh, why do you feel like this is important? I think that um, the hero's arc acts as a way of, it acts as an aspirational plot. Um, and by a sense of that, it is moralizing. It's basically showing, guiding your own decisions in your own life, uh, which is sort of a future looking attitude. I think by not featuring the hero's plot and showing people grapple in the wrong ways with things, that helps readers look at their own past and make sense of it. Um, which I think is basically just as important for growth as some sort of idealized um, virtue or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we have a question from Guatham, uh, who has a question for both uh, you, uh, both Andrew and Hermione, who says, um, who are some of your favorite poets and authors? Anybody with a sense of humor? Uh, anybody obscure that you'd like to recommend? Never anyone asks me what I'm reading. I just have a... <laughs> 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 I've never read Nothing. a book. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't know what any of this is. <laughs> um, I'm reading. I mean, it's, it's hugely canonical in um, Portugal, but I hadn't heard of it before my partner gave it to me. An incredibly funny novel called The Mayas, um, which is kind of, it's sort of um, Proust, but Portuguese. Um, it's kind of, you know, these foppish, ridiculous young men, and it's a very long sort of novel about society and, um, you know, uh, people having affairs and, and all that, and it's very funny. So I think this person was asking about funny things. So um, yeah, that's a funny novel, The Mayas, M-A-I-A-S. I, uh, I also freeze up whenever I'm asked by name writers. Um, so, 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 this isn't humor at all, but it did make me laugh out loud consistently, is a couple of books by an author named William Ian Miller, who is a nonfiction writer. He's a, I think he's a um, law professor who writes about philosophy, but two of his books I've read are Disgust and Humiliation. And they're basically Wait. just, yeah, they're just, they're just one book's about disgust and the other is about humiliation. And he just writes sort of brutal summing up the human um, condition and tendencies with just such brutal brevity and accuracy that you just feel ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're both tremendous. And then Chris, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, go on. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say I had a follow-up question, but if you had something you wanted to continue with, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think I find the question so ba so not baffling. Um, I'm stymied by it because I think almost all the writers I love have some humor in them, even if they're not like slap your thigh, laugh out loud. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just a quality I I need, you know, like a sense. Or attracted to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I really love Sylvia Townsend Warner, who is definitely in touch with the absurdity of our species. I'm just naming dead people, I realize. I think <laughs> a lot of dead people recently. They're, they're funnier that way, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, Chris follows up uh, with, a, with a similar question, but says, are there any great books about, about writing or, or, and about writers in the publishing industry that you would recommend? And not necessarily how-to, but like novels about writing and publishing. Hmm. It's, it's difficult. Um, the last resort. <laughs> I 
I mean, I, I was thinking about how many novels within novels there are, and I thought of Asymmetry, which I thought was a mm -hmm. example of that. I don't know if you read that one, Andrew. I have, yeah, by Lisa yeah. Halliday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really hard. It's hard. Uh, yeah. I don't I think if you asked me to name 10 books I read right now in my entire life, I wouldn't be able to name 10 <laughs> books. And I don't know. I, I don't know. And when people are. For the yeah, record, I have read at least 10 books, but at least I, 10. <laughs> I <can name> them. <laughs> yeah, I, I always think of uh, novels about MFA students for some reason. Um, see, uh, I don't know if that counts. It's technically about writing and writers. Um, yeah. Oh, my God. What's, what's one that's soft? Oh, sorry. Go yeah, on. They're all, oh, I was going to say the uh, novel by the soft school writer. Um, um, Lucy Eyes. What's it called? Yeah, Lucy Eyes. That's the yeah. book I of. Louder Milk a is a one. great, it's a very funny book. Louder Milk, yeah. And Mona Awad has a very funny book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Funny. Also mm -hmm. about an MFA program. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Another shout out for, I guess, early work, Andrew Martin's book, also about writers or a writer. Uh, yeah, if any more pop pop into your head just just screen them <laughs> as we as we go on to the next question well the 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 rachel cusk outline trilogy oh. i guess it, mm -hmm. it's you don't really see a lot of writing but she's very much the writer incarnate and in that she only records other people's stories mm -hmm. um i actually had a, a question as well uh I, I kind of alluded this uh to at the start of the presentation but um, I was struck as I read along that you you decided to include real life institutions in your novel, for example, real life bookstores, um, like recognizable literary institutions, uh, not necessarily publishers, but, um, you know, I think if you read into it, you can kind of like put some pieces together. It seems like some of these publishers are amalgams of, of other publishers. Um, but why the decision to include real life places and uh, follow up, did Greenlight Bookstore know that they were going to be featured in the novel? No, they definitely didn't. And I just, it gave me that feeling, like I said before, of just higher stakes of just, it just felt riskier and um, why not at the end of the day? I, you know, I mentioned like Dwight Gardner by name and James Wood, who mm -hmm. are both critics. Yeah. And actually one of one of my editors said, let's change these. And then my editor, Jonathan Glossy said, we published what? He'd love it. Yeah. Then yeah was, I was going to say, publish both James Wood and Dwight Gardner. So you just right. give him a call, make sure it's fine. No, I, I the way you, yeah. Well, I don't think either would mind being mentioned. What I worried more about is the fact that I put, I, I write and say that it's their words. And obviously I could never yeah. Im imitate either of them, but that <laughs> felt like more of a, and you know sort of an insult but i think I the think description of the james wood review was really accurate the fact that he only comes out to like uh every like it's very rare these days that he has like a like a pan review and then when he does come out it's you know just not not like it used to be right i thought of the way because andrew your novel is um so uh wonderfully thrillingly realist and um Spencer your question makes me think of the way that at a you can fabricate things up until a certain point of fame um so and and that's when mm -hmm. the person you know gains entry kind of breaks through into the world of the novel so if I were Dwight Garner or James Wood I'd be very flattered because it's like I think it's a mark of having you know transcended right mm -hmm. a certain degree of recognizability or something Yeah, I did. Um, I did also mention like a New York Times, um, like book beat reporter named Alexandra Alter. And I don't think anyone who, oh, uh -huh. book, what, you know, she, cause she's, she's not, you know, as famous as Dwight Garner, um, or right. James Wood. But she is and what, <laughs> she's, she's yeah. real and kind of, you know, not ordinary, but I, I guess I, I don't really have that license to use her name because she, she doesn't, you know, she's not famous. Right. Um, I sort of felt like that was going to be edited out at one point, but it wasn't. So here we are. No, that was a very, uh, it was a very real detail for me. Cause I think especially like booksellers often read those, those articles she writes. Cause it's often like, you know, twice a year, she'll write a 
book sales are up or book sales are down or things are good, things are bad, supply chain is disaster, and everyone kind of passes those articles around in our circles. So I, I appreciated that that detail. Thank you. Let's see here. Um, is there, I guess another question is, is there a part of the publicity process that you enjoy as someone who's kind of, who's who's now enduring it currently? Yeah, is there a single part of it that I enjoy? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> no, I, um, well, I think my, this process is sort of, you know, not what the usual process is. You know, I had a launch and looked out onto a crowd of people with masks on. It's basically a bad dream. Um, but, you know, I get a lot of uh, oxytocin or whatever when I see a review has been written. I love getting contacted by readers or booksellers on like DMing me. That just makes me, that just mm -hmm. makes me happy like for a while. Um, yeah, just, I mean, to know that people are reading it and that it means something to them is is why you write at all, so. How long, yeah, that's how long was this in coming, Andrew? How long had you worked on this book? I started this book in 2018. And honestly, most of the time between then and when I sold it was um, trying to sell it. Yeah. So I so wrote What it. were you doing? Oh, yeah. go ahead. Um, no, I was just gonna say, so I wrote it fairly quickly, sorry. No, I was just going to ask, so what were you doing before then, leading up to, uh, before you started writing the novel? Yeah, I was writing um, other novels that are um, to never see another human. <laughs> but actually, I wrote um, the book within the book I actually wrote. So that made... Did you really? The, uh, yeah, so that made the excerpt scenes just sort of, you know, copy, copy paste. Copy paste, yeah. yeah. That's extraordinary. Well, yeah, that is extraordinary. Really I didn't write it. I didn't write it as like an exercise of like a method acting sort of thing. I I wrote yeah. it in hopes of selling it, which which never happened, unfortunately. But then it gave rise to this. That's true. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Um, I think that that's all all the time we have for tonight. Um, Andrew, Hermione, do you have any final words before we close out the evening? No, thanks so much for having us, and everyone buy Andrew's book. It's awesome. <laughs> And thank you, Hermione, for your great questions and Spencer for hosting us. So oh, nice. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you all for uh, out there who, uh, for listening tonight. Um, we're going to have a recording of this uh, ready for you later. We'll send it out to everyone who registered. Again, the book is Last Resorts. You can come pick it up at Third Place Books uh, in Seattle or at your local independent bookstore. Um, thank you once again, Andrew and Hermione. And have a good evening. Bye. Bye.